possible a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. Okay, that is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is prime time where we bring you all the stories that matter on the show tonight. A blow for Sunak just minutes before his crunch vote on the Rwanda plan as right-wing Tory MPs say they cannot support the bill. We'll be live in Westminster in just a few seconds' time as voting gets underway and we'll bring you results as soon as we get them. Rishi Sunak has staked his leadership on getting this policy through and if it doesn't fail, has he only delayed the pain until the new year? We'll bring you analysis of tonight's vote with my panel here in the studio, Politico's UK editor Jack Blanchard and columnist and broadcaster Emily Sheffield. Also tonight, as Harry and Meghan's Ashwell Foundation suffers a nearly £9 million drop in donations, we ask, is this the beginning of the end for Brand Sussex? This is Primetime. Well, situation in Westminster tonight, as ever, fast moving. So let's go straight to Parliament's central lobby. The Sun's deputy political editor, Ryan Sabey, friend of the show, joins us live, been covering it all. Ryan, I mean, tell us the very latest, because stuff's just changed in the last few minutes. That's right. It really has been a day of high drama here down at Westminster. In the last few minutes, Marc Francois, who's, uh, who's the, the spokesperson for um, a group of uh, five families of uh, Conservative groups, has actually said, has actually recommended that, uh, the, uh, that those groups actually abstain from the, uh, the, the vote tonight. And that means there could be 40 people, not 40 Tory MPs, not voting with the government. So it really is on a little bit of a knife edge uh, tonight. Uh, the government only need 57 abstentions to actually see the, see the bill uh, fall, and that's not passed at second reading. So it really is going to be a little bit tighter than what the government envisaged first thing this morning. Yeah, and a reminder to our viewers, if it does fall at the reading, that would be the first time since 1986. It's certainly not something Sunak wants to be seeing. We'll have some analysis on the abstentions shortly, but say, Ryan, rather, I shouldn't call you Sabi, on air, uh, we just want to talk to you a little bit about the immigration minister, because the former immigration minister, Robert Jenrick, here he was earlier today giving his view on the weakness of the bill. The provision in the bill today is sophistry. It is the express policy of the government that Rule 39 injunctions are binding and to ignore them would be a breach of international law. So the, we are being asked to vote for a provision which it would be illegal to use. Well, no surprises, he's not a fan. I think you were sat in the studio with me last week, Ryan, when, when he basically stood down over this bill. What do we know about the other rebels and where they currently stand on it? Well, you've got the likes of Danny Kruger. Again, he's part of that new Conservatives uh, group. And he actually said the government should pull the bill. Now, he's actually said tonight that he cannot vote for it. So he's going to be one of those ones who's abstaining. And there's also on the other side, you've got the One Nation uh, Conservatives, one of the leading figures uh, on that side. It's very senior Tory MP Bob Neill. He's actually said this uh, legislation actually sails so close to the wind, he can only just vote for it. So on one side, you've got the uh, the right-wing MPs who say that it needs to go further, and on the other side, you've got the left-wing MPs who say you cannot go an inch further than that because we'll all just walk away and not support it. And on the other hand, you've got Rwanda who say they have gone as far as they can as well. So Rishi Sunak tonight is playing three-dimensional chess with all of this. Let's get a sense of what's going to happen in the next 30 to 40 minutes or so, what you're looking out for. Talk to us about the voting, the amendments they're voting on, and when we might be able to hear some kind of result. Yeah, I think we'll get the result at about 7.30 this evening. There is a, a vote at the moment going on at the, uh, um, with the, with the Labour amendment that will, that, will, that will not pass, and then it'll be the big showdown event. And at that moment, you'll just know whether the government has, uh, has lost this vote. 
But with this 40 abstentions, this big group of Conservatives who um, the recommendation has gone out to them to abstain, I've just spoken to one ex-Cabinet Minister, a leading figure in that group, who said he's going to vote for the government. So it's, it is slightly up in the air whether uh, there'll be a, the, the government uh, legislation tonight will fall. Because there may be enough people who are just going to hold their noses, go through the voting lobby and vote for the government and they get through to see another day. But the actual rebels themselves are saying that the government need to make amendments at third reading, which is the next stage of this legislation. So they are kind of expecting it to go through. But it is going to be very, very tight. Ryan Savey, Deputy Political Editor at The Sun, thanks so much for speaking to us in the lobby this evening. We'll let you get back to it. Let's now bring in tonight's panel for more on this. In the studio, Politico's UK editor Jack Blanchard and broadcaster and columnist Emily Sheffield. Thank you both for making time on a busy day, a busy evening. Let's just start with this analysis of the abstention. Just remind our viewers, Jack, if you could, what it means for these group of MPs to abstain from the vote. It means you don't turn up. <laughs> it means the, uh, the Prime Minister, the leader of your party, says, right, MPs, you will come and go through this voting lobby and vote for my bill, and they sit there with arms folded and they don't move and they don't do it. They don't vote against it, but they don't vote for it either. And why do they do that? They, they're doing it because they don't actually want to defeat the bill at this moment. They think they want to... This is a show of strength by these backbench Tories to say, look, we've got the numbers. If we all voted against this now, you would lose, Prime Minister, but we're not going to do it. We're going to stand here with our arms folded and show you that we're prepared to do that and give you a chance in January to change this bill in the way that they want it. They want to toughen it up and even harder... Uh, line on immigration and on the, uh, the, the European court rulings than it currently is. And, and to give him one opportunity to do that before they say they would then vote it down. Now, whether they would actually be prepared to do that is kind of, we don't know. It's a game of chicken. But for now, it sounds like they're going to give him an extra go at it. It could be a bit of delayed pain or it could be a bit of process. And, you know, nobody wants to rush through these things. But, Emily, when I think about... The voters, I think probably the last thing they want to see is 40 MPs folding their arms and saying, I'm not going to do anything, even if it's in their best interest of getting a draft that they would rather see go through, but also just more wrangling. Uh, I think we shouldn't actually make decisions for the voters that we don't actually know. I do mm. think a huge amount of voters are much more concerned with the cost of living, the possibility of a recession, what's happening in the NHS. But polling tells us a huge amount of voters really care about stopping the boats, immigration. And I think we'll agree, I don't think they want to see the wrangling, but they do want to see action. And this is where, and it's a very slim danger for Labour, because let's, let's face it, the polls are very much looking, they're 23 points ahead in the polls. But the fact is immigration and stopping the boats is an issue for lots of voters. And Labour is continuing its plan of sitting on the sidelines going, oh, the government woke, 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 can't do anything, that's and that. But what's their answer? And I think the one slim, slim sort of road through that Sunak, I'm sure, is hoping for, and I'd say pinning his electoral hopes on stopping the boats was always a huge gamble. If he pulls this off and if he, like, stands up to the right in the next reading, he is going to look like the prime minister to a lot of voters who is at least tackling immigration. I'm not saying that's going to win the election next year, but it's going to start ticking off one of the big things that he promised them, which is stopping the boats. But it isn't the biggest. And we've had analysis on this show. We spoke to a pollster last night, uh, uh, Professor John Curtis, who was saying that the average voter really is looking at the cost of living. They are looking at the NHS. That's the things they care about. Well, yes, they care about immigration at the same yes, time. Yes, the government will also be hoping that inflation is going to keep on dropping. That's going to make people... Inflation is the one thing, the one big thing that is hitting our pockets the hardest. So they are hoping that inflation is going to keep on falling. Listen, I'm saying these are incredibly slim routes through. I'm not <laughs> saying I think the Tories are going to win the next election. I'm just saying these are the things that the Sunak team will be hoping for. And on the NHS, they're going to still be hoping they're going to bring down those waiting lists. In fact, they're increasing. But, you know, again, they're going to be hoping if they can work on a few of those five, mm. if Labour's still sitting there going and not really coming up with any answers of their own, and Labour are, are doing this at the moment, they're trying not to come up with too many answers, and that's a political strategy, electoral strategy, just let the Tories deal with all the difficult issues, possibly mess them up, and we come in as the voice of change, promising lots of things but being, you know, quite vague. So A, the mm. Tories can't nick them, B, we can't, as the media, sort of pick apart all their policies. I, 
it's it's such a slim route through for the Tories, but I'm I'm guessing this is where they've been cornered into at this stage. We will be analysing Labour but later on in the show. We're going to have a former political secretary to Tony Blair and to talk about this. And we also had somebody from Labour together last night on this show, which is an influential think tank on that side of the party. And I said to him, you know, what is Labour on migration? Because people do say that they don't know, and they've got a five point plan. But understand, it's not hitting with the public. Look, before we move on to other topics, Jack, I want to come back to you on this breakfast meeting that was had this morning with these rebels on the so-called far right of the Conservative Party, these people who are probably going to abstain this evening. Were the croissants just not warm enough? They just, you know, <laughs> Sunak just wasn't able to pull them over the line, clearly. I mean, this is not... If, if they all abstain tonight, that is not a terrible result for Rishi Sunak, given the absolutely catastrophic position he is in. This is actually OK. If they voted against it, if there's 40 of them and they voted against it, that would be the end of this bill. It would finish over. He's lost. If he's convinced them to at least give him more time, those bacon butties this morning have probably done their job. They were never going to vote for this bill. They'd already said that. It, all he wanted to, to convince him this morning was don't kill it now. And it would seem that he has done enough. So maybe the, uh, the HP sauce and the sausages <laughs> did the trick. Um, but I think, uh, you know, let's, let's be clear. If Rishi Sunak squeaks through tonight, he, it, he isn't in a great position. He's just delayed the pain until January. He is going to have a massive fight with his party then. Because as you heard that earlier from Ryan, the right of the party want him to go further. The other side of the party won't let him. Probably the House of Lords won't let him either. The idea that there's some path through for this legislation, I cannot see what it is. And of course, don't forget, even if he finds a way through Parliament with it, nobody knows if it's going to work. Lots of these people think it's still going to get struck down by the courts. And even if it gets through the courts, nobody knows if it's going to work. How many people, are getting, how many people is, are getting deported yeah. to Rwanda? A few hundred? We, we don't really know. We need to remind know. ourselves the reason it's they're doing this. It's completely unproven. It's a it might work. Well, it might be. But it's unproven. There's never yeah. been a successful policy like this. So maybe. But there's a, so many ifs in this actually going the way Rishi Sunak wants to. And as you say, there's all these other issues on the table where he's failing from the economy to the NHS and so on and so on. So <laughs> the path to the Tories being seen as the saviours of the country feels about as slim as it possibly could be. But I think we're also you know. seeing, and it's, 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 it's maybe a sort of side note to make, is that we're seeing the right of the party sort of forming round a new sort of totemic campaign, and this is to drop out of the ECHR. And given that then, Emily, um, because I'm with you on that, there does, this is totemic. There does, and we are aware that splits, the shifts, the divisions within the party. Mm. But whenever I have a guest on and ask them who the future leader of the party could be, if somebody is manoeuvring, nobody seems to be able to point at someone. Today, the latest I heard was Kemi Badenoch could be a contender. I mean, who would you single out at this point that would unify that part of the party? I wouldn't. I think there's a real problem in, in, in the Tory party is that it's got this incredibly well-organised right. You know, I'm not going to say they're far right, but they really, they do tend to form around these, you know, totemic things they want to achieve. It was dropping out of the EU. Now it's going to be dropping out of the ECHR. And I, and I think it is a real problem in the Tory party. Labour's got its factions as well, but the Tory right is particularly vicious, if I might say. And they've been... And, the, you know, there's a few of them, Marc Francois and a few others. They, they, they've been around for a long time. They know how it works. And um, there's a lot of, may I say, in a politest way I can, quite a lot of big egos there. The party is essentially unleadable, and you can mm. see that by the fact that we've had five prime ministers in the, the 12 or 13 years that the Conservatives have been in power. Labour's only had mm. six prime ministers in his entire history, and, and, and you know, the, the, the Tories are just going through them faster than anything, and, you know, even if Rishi Sunak did squeak a win in the election next year, how long would he last mm. with this lot underneath him? You know, they, they, they love toppling leaders and putting in someone even more radical, and then they turn on that one, and we're seeing it now to Sunak, just as we saw them turn on trust, just as we saw them turn on Boris Johnson, just as they did to Theresa May, David just, Cameron. Just to break in here, the Tories have, you know, been in power a lot more than Labour, so they're obviously doing Oh, well, right. that's a comeback, but still, I think... When <laughs> I'm you just trying to balance up. the debate here. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you two, we're going to keep you here in the studio and have a lot more analysis throughout the show next here on Prime Time. As we're talking about this, Akia what Starmer has waded in on this Tory turmoil today, you can imagine why. He says he can get Britain back on track, but has he done enough to encourage voters to Steer Karma. We'll have more on that next. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. 
criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm off calm. Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas it possible a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, Rosanna Lockwood, bringing you this breaking news in just the last few minutes from the House of Commons. The Labour amendment to the Rwanda bill has failed. And this was Labour's bid, essentially, to scrap the bill. Let's bring in our panel tonight. Once again, Politico's UK editor Jack Blanchard and columnist and broadcaster Emily Sheffield and the both of you. This means, essentially, that this has gone Sunak's way. This part of the vote this evening is just the first part, um, but Labour were basically saying that uh, the bill doesn't address the tack, you know, the smuggling of people across the channel and the gangs and everything else. And for that reason, they didn't want this to go ahead. They've been voted against 337 against 2694. So they have failed in that. I mean, Sunat will be pleased. Yeah, although absolutely, as expected, these opposition party mm. uh, attempts to bring down a bill like this, all, they always put them forward because they're the opposition, that's their job, they oppose mm -hmm. the government stuff, and Tory MPs would never vote for for a, a Labour amendment to strike the bill down. If they didn't like the bill, they'd do it themselves. They wouldn't want to be seen to be following Keir Starmer, the Labour leader's attempt to do that. So, uh, yeah, it's good news for Rishi Sunak, but uh, there was no way that this wasn't going to happen. Um, Labour's position on this broader policy is essentially that they say it just won't work. Mm. That this this is a hugely expensive way of trying to deal this, with this problem. We've already heard the government spent, what, 300, 350 million pounds on this policy? They and, think it's going to be 390 and, 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 by 2026. There you go. And, and no flights yet have taken off at all. So that's a, it's a huge amount of money. And Labour say this is just not the way to tackle the problem of people coming across on small boats. They say there's no evidence that this threat to send people to Rwanda 
will stop people coming. There's no evidence of that. And, uh, and anyway, the flights aren't taking off. So what are we doing? That's their position. You know, if I was Labour, Emily, I would focus on the cost of this plan and how much money has been sunk into it, because that's something a lot of people can wrap their heads around. At the same time, the UK's asylum system costs £3 billion a year in this country, so we all know something needs to be done. But uh, I would say the money is not being focused on the right place if I was the opposition. I mean, it seems like an easy target. Well, they are... I mean, the Tory... The government are spending money left, right and centre. They've given France a huge amount of um, cash up front to try and stop people getting in the boats in the first place, police, policing the beaches. They've, um, they're pumping extra cash into um, lowering the, um, the, the huge cure people waiting to have their asylum processed. That's one mm. of the things that's costing us the most, actually, because we're putting asylum seekers up in hotels and there's a huge backlog and that's partly over the pandemic, through the pandemic, partially, I think, because sometimes um, there is an actual plan to make getting asylum very difficult because mm. they're trying to act, is, is, that, is it a deterrent in itself? So there is a huge amount of money um, being spent. And I think, yes, Labour, again, I do think their problem is they can keep just criticising everything the Tories are doing. They do need to come up with a better plan than we'll give this money to France. Mm. We'll work more with international communities. That is already happening. And there are lots of European countries who are probably looking at what the UK is trying to do with a lot of interest because they have huge problems with asylum seekers too. And everyone's looking for an answer. And again, I don't think it's one answer. It's not just the Rwanda stop the boats deterrent. It has to be a whole group um, of uh, deterrents working together. Mm. Um, so it's not, this is not solely focused on what the UK is doing. It's just sometimes I slightly wish, does the UK sort of feel like it has to drop out of everything uh, to reform what's going on? I, I you know, I just like wish we'd stay in a group and, well, and, some and work it through together. Staying in a group of countries may have helped with the coordination of this type of thing. Maybe I'm not sure that's, that that that's true. Actually, I, I think I think I think in a minor way we had an agreement that we could set, process some and send them back. Um, to the country of origin. But in reality, there were very, very few um, asylum seekers re being returned to France. I, I think that the point on Labour is definitely a reasonable one. They don't have some master plan to fix this. But potentially what they would have at least is a united party that meant that they could do something in government. The problem that Rishi Sunak's got, as we were just saying, is that the Tories are so divided that we have this deadlock. And I think we're going to see this deadlock again in the new year. And in fact, through much of next year as he tries to get this plan through. Let's speak to somebody who knows quite a bit about Labour strategy and ask, indeed, what they should be doing. Former yeah. political secretary to Tony Blair, John McTernan. And, uh, John, just uh, on the conversation I was just having there with Jack and Emily in the studio, and it's a theme that does recur, I find, when we're talking about this topic, is people feel like Labour is not clear enough on how they're going to tackle both legal and illegal migration. What do you say to that? Well, the first thing I'd say is that there's no point in saying anything about any policy area while the government are falling apart. Um, never interfere with your opponent when they're making a mistake is really good strategic advice. Um, let the government show that they are incapable of tackling this issue. And for Labour to have a 9% lead, as it does in the most recently published poll, uh, amongst the voters, in its, its, you know, their confidence in it dealing with immigration is you know, it, it's historically quite significant. Labour uh, are normally not seen as the party of tough action on immigration, the issue here is the government has seen of utterly incompetent, seen as being utterly incompetent in the area. Look, in terms of uh, letting your opponent just sort of self-destruct, uh, so everyone focuses on that. You know, Keir Starmer did have a long planned speech today, uh, and he didn't seem to mind being overshadowed by this Rwanda vote. In fact, playing on it quite understandably. Do you think he used it to his utmost advantage? Look, the thing, the thing, the thing that he did in his speech today was uh, he starts to lay uh, the groundwork for the general election. He basically said, as he said at conference, and, and Rachel said, Rachel Reeves, she had a chance to said at conference, it's taken the Tories 13 years to wreck our country. It's going to take a decade to rebuild it. And the thing is, you have to start thinking about the future, building for the future. Uh, and there's a choice at the next election. And the choice is, you know, who do you think can build the better future? There's absolutely no doubt the Tories have demonstrated they can't, they can wreck a future, they can't build a future. And Labour has to start to outline, you know, 
build on the confidence that voters have in it. With with, with poll leads between 15 and 20, 20 points, clearly Labour is doing something right, uh, particularly given that we had our worst election defeat since the 1930s, uh, just four years ago. You know, is it today? This, it means it's four years anniversary come, coming up for that defeat. So um, that's really important for, for, for Labour. And on issues, on issues like this, um, on, on, on migration, the first thing to do is not be cruel. I mean, that's what's the, the, the terrible thing about this, is that the government keep going, if we can be crueler and crueler and crueler, that's the way to deter people from even coming to our country in the first place. And that actually is very un-British. Uh, I think it's a profound breach with the way Britain has been in the world uh, for the democratic era. I think that's a really interesting point, John, and I can feel my panel reacting to that in the studio, so I'll come back to them after the break for more reaction to that. But John McTernan joining us there, former political secretary to Tony Blair. Next here on Primetime, we'll have plenty more reaction, both from our panel and from the House of Commons as the Rwanda vote results come in. Stay with us. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Prime Time. Now, we are staying with this Rwanda vote in the House of Commons this evening. Our chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell, is down there in the lobby of Parliament. Uh, Peter, we love having you on air just as breaking news is coming through. I don't think it's come through yet, but just tell us where we're at with the latest on this vote. 
Well, the breaking news will happen in the next few minutes, Rosanna, because there's going to be a bell that will go off behind me in about two minutes' time. That's the division bell. And quite literally, the House divides and they go through the lobbies and decide how to vote. Now, it's looking very, very tight for Rishi Sunak. We've had one vote this evening that uh, resulted in a loss for a Labour amendment. That was always going to happen. But actually, this is the main substantive vote on the second reading of the Safety of Rwanda bill. Now, we know that at least 40 Conservative MPs are probably going to abstain. If up to 57 of them abstain, Rishi Sunak's OK. But if he reaches that number of 57, well, then the bill will fail. So this is really, really tight. It's a crucial vote. It's absolutely fascinating. As you, If you're watching on Talk TV, you can see, or perhaps you can hear if you're listening on Talk Radio, the lobbies behind me are filling with MPs, with journalists. They will, the MPs will literally walk through the division lobbies. Uh, they've got eight minutes to do so after the bell starts to ring. And then we will find out the fate of Rishi Sunak's Rwanda plan. There's the bell going off now. Perhaps you can hear it the division bell that is summoning the MPs to those division lobbies. They'll have eight minutes to go through them if they want to, although we know that some are abstaining. And then we will see what happens to Rishi Sunak's flagship policy. Uh, Peter, I can now um, bring to you the numbers. The vote has passed. I'm getting the numbers 313 have voted okay. for and 269 have voted yes. against this evening. This will, of course, be a relief yes, if, for Sunak. It will indeed. So that's what, I'm trying my mental arithmetic here, um, we've, got, we've got, what, 44 majority. So that is a huge uh, majority for Rishi Sunak. Uh, that is something that he will be very, very happy with in terms of that majority. And yes, I've literally just been sent, sent that. So the bill has passed. Majority of 44. So he's out of the woods. He is out of the woods. And remind our viewers what this means for the next stage of the bill then. Well, this will then go further, it'll go to the third reading and there will be many amendments that will be put on this bill at the time because there are lots of people, including Marc Francois of the European Research Group, who's saying that there will be amendments put to it. Now it's interesting that Rishi Sunak said last week at the press conference on Thursday that when the uh, when there are um, if there are amendments put to this, well, there's only uh, there are those on the right of the Conservative Party who are, as he put it, just an inch away from his particular perspective on this. He's worried about losing the One Nation side of the Conservative Party and also worried about losing the Rwandan government on all of this as well. But he has uh, he has got home on this. He has got a 44 majority, and he will be very happy with that. But the problems are just beginning for Rishi Sunak on this still. So there's a lot more to do, and that will come after Christmas. Peter Carwell, thanks so much. And I understand from the lobby. We can also speak to Jake Berry MP as well, who is standing by, Conservative MP, of course, and we'll get his view on this vote as well. Uh, we'll also be coming back to our panel in the studio to get their uh, response to things. I mean, uh, Jack and Emily, you were sitting there and listening uh, to that. I mean, Jack, any, any surprise that it's passed? Uh, once the rebels said that they would abstain, that they'd sit the vote out rather than vote against, I think it was always going to go through tonight. Uh, but as we were saying earlier, that's a merely a temporary reprieve for the Prime Minister because this bill has to have more votes in the new year and these rebels are not saying, yes, this is all fine, carry on. Mm -hmm. They're saying, right, you change it now, you rewrite this, you do a better job, you make it harder, or we will vote against it next time round. So this is going to spoil Rishi Sunak's Christmas. <laughs> there will yeah. be no New Year celebrations in the Sunak household instead he's going to be banging his head against the table for the next few weeks trying to figure out how he can give these MPs what they want without upsetting the rest of his party who don't want it to be any tougher. Emily what from what you study of Sunak from what you know of him what you've seen of him do you think you can see him making a lot of concessions here to the right of the party when he needs to? I think he'll make um, the concessions he needs to but I think there's going to be a lot of um, uh, I'm going to go slightly against Jack in here. I think Sunak's in a more confident position than people think. The right always make trouble. And they know they've got a moment to make trouble here. But there will be people like Lord Cameron going around and reminding everybody one year in power is worth five years in opposition. And I do think... I do think that is going to work a I bit. I don't think they really like Lord Cameron very much. They don't. But <laughs> I'm not sure he's the message carrier for this I don't think they one. do. Well, you, you say that, but yeah. Cameron was the one who did defy Strasbourg over prisoners' voting rights. So he has got history in defying mm -hmm. Strasbourg. So I don't right. think the right see him as, as um, particularly soft on immigration. I think he was actually a Tory prime minister that was pretty tough on immigration. We will come back to you. We've got Jake Berry MP now standing by in the lobby for us. And Jake, just tell us what you make of the vote passing. 
Well, I've, I've been dragged here by Peter Cardwell uh, uh, following going through that division lobby. Look, what we've seen tonight is a good victory for the Prime Minister, but it may turn out to be a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. The collective decision of the right of the Conservative Party is that this bill is about as appealing as bin bag juice, and uh, they have reserved their judgment. They think they can improve it but they may collectively come together with some on the left of the party to vote it down at third reading. This group calling themselves the, the five families, a bit like the godfather, they decided this evening they weren't going to be like Sonny Corleone and rush out there and fire all their shots at the first uh, opportunity to do so. They're keeping their powder dry. In fact, it will be like Michael Corleone when he says, today is the night that the Corleone family pay their debts if they are not happy with this bill at third reading. Uh, Jake, as an MP, uh, and you're speaking here to an audience of voters, what reassurance can you give them that your party knows what it's doing at the moment, that it's got some kind of control on this issue? Well, look, in terms of immigration, it splits down in two parts. The Prime Minister's been clear on illegal immigration. He will stop the boats. The debate we've seen tonight is whether this legislation is part of the arsenal that he can use to do that. Now, the view of the right of the Conservative Party was let's abstain, let's not support this bill and let's try and improve it because they do not think, including me, I do not think that it goes far enough. On the wider question of the mass migration, the legal migration we've seen, of course, 750,000 people coming to the UK next or last year, we've seen some great action from the Prime Minister on that, not least last week, where the announcement he made around salaries should see up to 300,000 people knocked off those numbers next year. I mean, uh, that was good news in terms of getting those migration numbers down, but came under quite a great deal of criticism as a kind of blunt tool to address legal migration issues, Jake. Well, there are very limited tools that the government has uh, to hand. We have this points-based immigration system so they can tweak various parts of it. They've chosen already to increase that salary threshold with the amount of money people should earn before they come to our country. We've heard, blunt as it may be, that that will cut 300,000 from numbers. They've said they're going to take action on student visas and on people bringing dependents into this country. There's no quick fix. Just like illegal migration, you have to take a blended approach. But it's absolutely clear to me that that coming general election, immigration is going to be a real key issue, not just from the Conservative Party, who are taking real action on it, but the Labour Party as well, who frankly today have been found wanting and having no plans. Well, the Labour Party today, the leader of which uh, Sir Keir Starmer was giving a speech, he accused your party, the Conservatives, of psychodrama. Today, your response to that? Well, my response is that, you know, Keir chose today probably one of the most important debates in terms of what the British public care about to toddle off to uh, uh, Silverstone, the home of British racing sport, maybe, but not, not in the seat of democracy like we're here in Parliament, and give a speech about, you know, uh, things, everything almost but immigration. He did speak briefly in that speech about immigration. What was clear to me, listening to what he said, is that he really has no plan. And people may think the Conservative plan is imperfect but at least we're the party who's trying to get on and talk about it. Jake Berry, MP, thanks for making time for us this evening there from the lobby. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Well, let's come back to our primetime panel in the studio. I'm conscious, Emily, I promised to come back to you on the comments that we got from John McTernan, who is a political strategy advisor for Labour, um, just before the break. And he was saying that the Rwanda plan, in broad terms, is cruel and un-British. And I felt you sort of react to that. What was your response? Um, because I think he's, he's washing over what happens um, while we're trying to stop the boats. A year ago, come on, come on. yes, this time last year, I remember reporting on all those deaths in the sea, you know, just a mile from our shores. You have to keep going back to the fact we are trying to stop illegal trafficking across the water. People are dying. Women and children are dying. And the minute one of those boats sinks again, it could be in the next week, it could be in the first week of New Year, and we have children washing up on the shores or being fished out the sea and women, I think there's going to be a massive clamour again to stop the boats. And this is the danger for Labour. It's a small one, because I do agree with McTernan. They are just sitting back as their thing and saying, well, yes, we know we're not seen as tough on immigration, 
but you know the Tories are now looking like they're sort of you know cats in a cats in a bag fighting with each other. But to say that it's like crueler and crueler and crueler, we're not. We're trying to stop one of the cruelest. Uh, one of the cruelest trades, apart from people trafficking, that goes on. And this is a form of people trafficking. And um, I think, again, you know, the reason I was tutting is that, is that it's, it's sort of pointing to sort of Labour's general attitude to immigration, which seems to be, oh, you know, God, a bit like welfare, don't we not talk about it, just let them all come in. Well, you can't just keep letting everybody in. We're also incredibly generous. We put 175,000 Ukrainians came into the country not long ago. We've had people from Hong Kong, Afghanistan. They have said that if they stop the boats, they're going to make sure that we can bring more people in, open it up. But those, you can't just have people piling into boats and everyone just turning up on the shore. A lot of those places, Hong Kong, um, Afghanistan, places in the Middle East, we owe a debt to the people no, uh, that are coming here, across. By the way, we can't even house half the people we have already bought over in Afghanistan. They are still sitting in hotels. There aren't enough houses for them. So there are lots of structural problems within Britain that we know Labour has rightly focused on housing, that mm. we can't just keep bringing more and more people into the country. We don't have the infrastructure. Let's bring Jack in on this, because I do get concerned that we, in the political, the journalist circles, get so involved in this story that we forget to stand back and look at what it actually is. And I remember when the Rwanda scheme was first announced, thinking, really? Uh, and now we're so far down the track. Do you think people do stand back and think of it as being cruel or necessary? Well, it, the polling just shows that people just think it isn't going to happen and it won't work. There is no faith out in the country in this policy because they just think it's it's pie in the sky, that these, they've seen these flights repeatedly fail to take off, they've seen the government defeated in court after court after court, and they've seen the... Conservatives make a lot of, lot of promises on immigration, first under David Cameron and ever since, and repeatedly and miserably failed to deliver those promises. And it happened again in 2019 when they said they would bring net migration down from the 200,000 it was, and it's now 700,000. So I'm afraid people mostly are just not listening. They're just going, this is just more talk from Conservative politicians who can't deliver on this. I don't think they've got any faith that Labour would do better on immigration, but they're certainly not going to vote for Conservatives on immigration anymore because the, the, the number of broken promises just stack up. Um, there was a knife-edge moment yesterday when the government accused the rebels on the right of the Tory party of being unpatriotic for wanting to go further in stretching the laws or disregarding human rights laws um, and everything else like that. And that went down very badly indeed with those rebels because patriotism is something that is at the heart of the tenets of what they stand for. Um, but again, do you think it deserves some standing back and analysing what it means to be British? Or do you think it's, as Emily put it, a necessary issue you've got to deal with for the British people? Well, I think you've got to separate the two things out. I don't think there's anybody in the country who thinks that people coming across on these dinghies in extremely dangerous conditions is a good idea. No one in the Conservative Party, no one in the Labour Party, none of the public, everyone wants to stop the boat. The question is then, how do you go about it? And is this, this grand scheme of sending people to Rwanda, which seems to be impossible, the best way to do that? Or are there other ways to try and tackle it? Labour say there are. They're not in government, we don't know. But um, I think that, that you have to separate those mm. two questions out. If you look at the polling, again, if you want to say, what do the public think? If you ask them about this Rwanda scheme, they're very divided. Frankly, um, they're very divided. And I thought the recent poll, correct me, because I did look at this like 10 days ago and it could have moved again, that 51% of the country were now in favour of the Rwanda deterrent. It's... it's it's pretty I understand split. that every, it's, every poll... It's, every it's, poll it's, it depends how you ask the question, yeah. <laughs> and it depends quite where the news is at. Yeah. But basically, Look. people are, are pretty split. This is not an overwhelmingly no, popular no. thing, but it is not overwhelmingly hated I, I was actually surprised either. at 51%, but uh, in favour. It, it, it moves and, around. And it has moved But if you ask them, it. will it work? Um, people no, just whilst, I'm sure that's a different people question. Yeah. Whilst having this discussion about um, where we stand on migration, how this country deals with it, it would be remiss of us not to mention what happened on the Bibby Stockholm bar today, uh, where an asylum seeker, a resident on the Bibby Stockholm, which is barge that's moored off Dorset, um, died, according to various reports, seemingly by suicide, and it's being investigated. And, of course, support is being brought in for those on board. There's 200 asylum seekers on that vessel. Remember, it was very controversial when it was introduced as well. It can house up to 500 people. Human rights campaigners have compared it to a prison ship. There was considerable opposition, and Charity Care for Calais says the UK government must take responsibility for this human tragedy. And this happened to Day whilst we were considering how the government would vote on this Rwanda bill.
Well, next here on Primetime, we're going to take a little bit of a break from this story and give you a little look at the latest royalty as Prince Harry and Meghan Markle seemingly reignite the battle of the royal brands despite huge Ashwell losses this year. Stay with us. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. away from the chaos of Westminster, shall we? Let's take a look at another story in the headlines today, and it's about the royals and those who are not so close to the royals anymore. We're talking about whether or not this could be the end of Brand Sussex. It emerged today that donations to Harry and Meghan's Archwell Charity Foundation have plunged by some $11 million over the past year, sending that company, that charity, into the red. The bosses and the couple's right-hand man, James Holt, have meanwhile been handed a massive 280% pay rise. But this hasn't stopped them sparking the latest instalment in the battle of Sussex versus Wales as we've been seeing play out just hours after the Princess of Wales shed a clip of herself and her three children volunteering at a baby bank. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex released a similarly glossy video across the pond showing Archwells. This is their charity's 2023 impact. So it's two glossy videos within about 24 hours of each other. These, this one minute clip from the Sussexes shows behind the scenes footage of the charitable projects that Archwell has helped throughout 2023. And while the couple have shared similar videos in the past, people have pointed out that they're usually not released until early January, these videos, to show the impact of the year before. It seems they moved quite quickly this time. Donations have taken a nosedive and Harry has been, of course, in this quest to take down the media, which has backfired in the courts this week at one point. 
No points for guessing then who is taking the crown, according to a lot of commentators, in the battle of the royal brands. In a moment, we're going to cross live to LA to get the US take on this from Kinsey Schofield. But first, let's speak to Talk TV royal correspondent Rupert Bell. Rupert, is this royal battle backfiring for Harry and Meghan? I mean, talk about it from where you see it, from the British side of things, which, you know, a lot of our viewers will be listening to this evening. <laughs> Do you think uh, this Archwell stuff is interesting? Uh, I think it is interesting. Um, uh, clearly, the first donation they got, they got a one of 10 million in the sort of startup of the foundation. It's quite normal for sort of uh, donations to go down, but it does seem a dramatic uh, drop off. And because obviously their brand has suffered over the year, um, and certainly people have become slightly disillusioned with the couple. I may be putting that slightly gently, very disillusioned, I think, with the couple. And also this, though, I think, to produce this slick video, trying to paint themselves in a good light after the sort of fallout from the end game book. So seeing that they are doing something. I think there's some eye watering salaries in this foundation as well for five employers. There's a lot of outgoings, well in excess of $500,000. So there's some very generous salaries being given to five members of the staff, although uh, Meghan and Harry say they don't take anything out of it. There's some also some eye-watering expenses in the accounts as well. But we do seem to be getting videos coming out from them. We've also now seen William bring out one, going to a homeless charity, which I know is something he's very passionate about. So there basically is a bit of a PR uh, the scrum going on at the moment and who can produce the most uh, uh, touching or, or significant moment. But all heartfelt, presumably from all parts, but we do know at the heart there are some PR people working the machine. So you do think it is incredibly uh, specific and targeted and direct and calculated, the release of these videos? I mean, in terms of Brand Sussex, you mentioned the Endgame book, Omid Scobie, this was, you know, he's not, they didn't directly contribute to this book, uh, which of course led to the whole royal race row because these alleged racism allegations were contained within the Dutch publication of the book, just reminding our viewers how that all went down. And, you know, the connection was drawn that there has been some sort of close relationship. Omid Scobie is based on the West Coast, but there, there was, was there a direct link between Scobie and the Sussexes? No, he's saying it's with friends and sources, but... You know, that if you've got friends and sources of them, then presumably they're getting their view of things. But I, I, I'm a, the answer is very simply, you say, is it a, a calculated thing from the Team Sussex? Absolutely it was, because they are trying to restore the balance in their favour. It's a long way to go um, in this country for them um, to get uh, some a semblance of popularity but seeing that the Archwell Foundation does at least appear to be doing something uh, in a minute slick video, um, I'm not what they're doing uh, is extremely worthy. But we know that there's a PR element for them to try and raise funds in the future. Rupert Bell, Royal Commentator for us this evening. Thank you. Well, for more on this and to get the Americans' perspective, I'm joined by uh, Royal Commentator Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, thanks for making time. Um, to speak to us, you heard what Rupert was saying just then. What do you make of this latest play by the Sussexes? Do you think it is a calculated PR strike? I do think I do think so. I think it was to, uh, aside from change the direction of our conversations about how this has been probably professionally the Sussexes' worst year. Between, I mean, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the Hollywood Reporter, which is basically the Bible here in Los Angeles, uh, naming the, the Sussex is one of the biggest losers in Hollywood in 2023 for their professional failures. That's Spotify. That's the whining in spare, they said. You know, they said that they they had this bubble of, of being better than everybody, and then in came South Park to pop that bubble. So the Sussexes are trying to distract from a lot of professional failures. I think they're also trying to distract from the positivity that we're seeing surrounding the royal family and, and the Wales family. Christmas time is their time to shine. And I think that there's a little animosity there. But it, the, the videos are incredibly different. You are seeing so much authenticity from the kids, these, these unscripted moments with, with Prince Louis and, and Princess Charlotte, off the cuff, their humor. And then this very glossy, you know, shielded video of, of Meghan and Harry Obviously, they they don't give us access to the kids unless Oprah Winfrey or Netflix are there with a the camera crew. Um, but you just see so much more sincerity from the royal family than Harry and Meghan. 
And in terms of the donation drop that we've got from Archwell, the Sussexes charity, I mean, it was listed in dollars and it was an $11 million loss in the donations, presumably quite heavily reliant on American donations to their charity. Does this, this mean that they're really losing popularity with the US audience? You know, I absolutely agree with you. I, I do think that that's a reflection of their, it not just, I think statistically there's proof that there's a loss in popularity here in the States, but I think that this is another uh, great point. Um, also, you know, when when Harry and Meghan spend so much time, this video is a good reminder that they, they do these things sometimes, but when you spend so much time complaining about your circumstances that uh, instead of talking about other people's you know, problems instead of talking about homelessness like Prince William or the the um, the trauma that can happen when you uh, become a mother for the first time, like the Princess of Wales. Um, Harry and Meghan are so fixated on their own problems that it's hard to invest in them. It's hard to invest in their charities because they spend so much time talking about themselves. In terms of Brand Kate, just briefly, Kinsey, um, the Princess of Wales, how strong is that in the US? Well, look at my hairdo. I mean, <laughs> that, fair point. Obviously, you did a lovely, <laughs> lovely job of it. Is pretty strong. <laughs> we I, absolutely adore her. A lovely job of it. Uh, what is it that Americans love about Princess of Wales? I think it's um, it is the never complain, never explain. She, no matter what is being thrown at her, she seems so elegant, so graceful, and so strong. Uh, she prioritizes motherhood, um, and she just seems so delicate and, but but at the same time, courageous to to go up and stand on these stages and talk to strangers and and to to take on this really difficult job. I think we look at princesses and we see the fairy tale, but that's not the real life. They are under a lot of scrutiny. These women. Kinsey Scope. Phil, thank you. Standing by, Piers Morgan. Did your donation to the Sussexes charity go missing, Piers? Well, you know what? I, I, I logged on to the Archerwell website and I saw a mission statement about it all being about compassion. And then I asked myself what I suspect everybody else is asking is, what part of what the Sussexes do looks like compassion? And when you reach the inevitable conclusion, none of it, and they're the two least compassionate human beings on God's earth, I decided not to donate. Uh, astonishing that. Um, I think they'll just assume a donation has got lost in the post, <laughs> Piers. <laughs> Piers Morgan Uncensored, of course, is up next. That's all we have time for on Prime Time tonight. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll be back here tomorrow. We might talk about something other than Westminster politics. Stay tuned and we'll see you. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues? Or the stories that impact your life? Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. Really? Well, this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs>
Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. <laughs> <laughs>